Please take your Bible and join me in the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 13, where we are going to begin in verse 15 in a moment. These are the prophecies of Jeremiah during the early years of King Jehoiakim, and that would be basically 608, 607, down maybe as far as 606 BC. And they are warnings that the judgment of God is coming against the land. That the things being said by the priests and the so-called prophets and the leaders of the kingdom, the king included, that everything's going to be fine, that there's nothing to worry about from the Babylonians, uh, all of that is being contradicted by one big-named prophet. That's Jeremiah. And that judgment is coming. So here's some more of that. Jeremiah 13, 15. Hear and give ear. So if you got ears to hear, then use them. Be not proud, for he who is has spoken. Give glory to he who is your God before he brings darkness, before your feet stumble on the twilight mountains, and while you look for light, he turns it into gloom and makes it deep darkness. So dark is the imagery of judgment here. So you need to seek God while it's still daylight while it's still possible to be saved and redeemed. Because once the darkness comes, big trouble. Verse 17, But if you will not listen, my soul will weep in secret for your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly and run down with tears, because he who is his flock has been taken captive. So Jeremiah chimes in here that he's going to be bawling his eyes out for the people that won't listen, who end up either dead or heading off to Babylonian exile. Verse 18, say to the king and the queen mother, so these sons of Josiah, uh, two of them I think have the same mom, uh, while uh, another has a different mom. So we're not sure exactly which one this is necessarily talking about. Um, whoever the king is right now, probably. But remember, all of Josiah's wives would have been considered queens. Uh, so this is probably going to end up true for several groups uh, within the kingdom. So say to the king and the queen mother, Take a lowly seat, for your beautiful crown has come down from your head. So you've lost your royal position. Take the crown off. Get ready for your own judgment. The cities of the Negev are shut up with none to open them. All Judah is taken into exile, wholly taken into exile. Uh, the Negev is the southern portion of Judah. It's down toward the top of the Sinai Peninsula. And uh, all of those places will be among some of the last holdouts against the Babylonian invasion. Lift up your eyes and see those who come from the north. So we know Babylon will be coming down from the north. Where is the flock that was given you, your beautiful flock? That being addressed probably to the leadership here. To the ones that were supposed to be taking care of the nation. The great shepherd, of course, is God himself. And these men were supposed to be the under-shepherds, working for God, taking care of the flock. And now God is holding them accountable. Where's the flock that I put into your hands? Uh, it's interesting, in the New Testament... Peter very much talks about the fact that elders and preachers in congregations will have to give an account to God for the flock that was under their care. And so that's one of the reasons those of us in uh, church leadership have got to be very seriously minded uh, in taking care of the flock of God. 
Verse number 21, what will you say when they set as head over you those whom you yourself have taught to be friends to you? Will not pangs take hold of you like those of a woman in labor? So what's going to happen when you lose your positions and you're the ones that are being bossed around, told what to do? If you say in your heart, why have these things come upon me? It is for the greatness of your iniquity and that your skirts are lifted up and you suffer violence. Uh, So they're going to be like, oh, poor me. Why did this happen to me? I didn't do anything wrong. And God's response is, are you kidding me? You have been lifting up your proverbial skirt to all the gods and goddesses around and all the nations around the area. What makes you think that you are not to blame for what's happened to you? Verse 23, can an Ethiopian change his skin? Uh, Ethiopian here, representing somebody with a very dark skin. Can a leopard change his spots? And the answer to both of those rhetorically is no. That's not the norm. Then also you can do good who are accustomed to do evil. So this is kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing. Apparently... The fact that you've been doing evil all this time is a good indicator you're not going to change. Even with all of my warnings, you haven't changed. So apparently this is just part of you. So verse 24, I will scatter you like chaff driven by the wind from the desert. You know, the processing of the wheat, the processing of any type of grain involve throwing the material up in the air. And the wind would blow the lighter weight chaff off to the side. And so here God is saying, I'm going to sift you guys uh, in a harvest. And I'm going to blow the chaff, the non-believers, the non-obeyers away. This is your lot, the portion I've measured out to you, declares he who is, because you've forsaken me and trusted in lies. I myself will lift up your skirts over your face and your shame will be seen. Wow, I I know this is really tough language right here. Uh, But the idea is, since you have been playing around on me, I'm going to just give you away. You've been lifting up your skirts to everyone around. I'm going to lift your skirts and put them permanently over your head and just give you to these judgmental, other nations. Verse 27, I have seen your abominations, your adulteries and neighings, your lewd whorings on the hills in the field. Now that's a whole big mixture of metaphors that have already appeared. Uh, The abominations of the idols, uh, the adulteries where they're cheating on God, The neighings goes back to where God said they were kind of like wild donkeys or wild horses that are always wanting to go and mate all over the place rather than stay home. And uh, then selling themselves, prostitution. All of this is, these are metaphorical descriptions of the cheating, the spiritual cheating that's been going on uh, with the people of Judah. Woe to you, O Jerusalem! How long will it be before you are made clean? So God is asking the question, what's it going to take to clean you guys up? And uh, his judgment is going to leave only a small remnant that will go into exile. And out of that remnant, an even smaller remnant is going to come back to the land and start over again with God. Chapter 14, the word of he who is that came to Jeremiah concerning the drought. One of the ways that God judged according to the curses of the covenant was to disrupt the weather cycle. And that would, of course, disrupt the agricultural cycle. So that must have been going on during this time period in Judah's history in its final years before it goes into Babylonian exile. And so this is the description of some of that. Verse 2, Judah mourns 
and her gates languish. Her people lament on the ground and the cry of servants go up. Uh, So the gates here represent the place where people gather to do merchandising, buy things, sell things, and also get judicial decisions. Uh, So it's like the city square. Uh, It's where the people come and they cry over the situation. Her nobles send their servants for water and they come to the cisterns. They find no water. They return with their vessels empty. They are ashamed and confounded and cover their heads. So when God disrupts the weather cycle, the cisterns where they collect the rainwater, they start drying up. So when the the more well-to-do send their servants to get water for their daily needs, they come back empty-handed and they are ashamed that they can't get their job done. Verse 4, because of the ground that is dismayed, since there is no rain on the land, the farmers are ashamed. They cover their heads. If you don't have water, you can't very well grow crops. And so you get ashamed of not being able to do your job as a farmer. Verse 5, even the doe in the field forsakes her newborn fawn because there is no grass. Not uncommon during famine times, Wild animals just get focused on their own survival, and they don't even take care of their babies. That's just the way it is. Verse 6, the wild donkeys stand on the bare heights. They pant for air like jackals. Their eyes fail because there is no vegetation. So even the wild animals, like wild donkeys, are losing uh, their physical uh, health because of the lack of of rain, and therefore the lack of fodder. Verse 7, Though our iniquities testify against us, act, O he who is, for your name's sake. For our backslidings are many. We have sinned against you. Here's Jeremiah interceding as a good, righteous man would do. God, please don't write us all off. Oh, your hope of Israel is Savior In time of trouble, why should you be like a stranger in the land, like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for a night? So, you're our hope. You're our Savior. Why should you be hardly ever here? Don't leave us alone, is what he's basically saying. Why should you be like a man confused, like a mighty warrior who cannot save? Yet you, O he who is, are in the midst of us, and we are called by your name. Do not leave us. So please, 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 God, don't abandon us all to this fate. Thus says he who is concerning his people. They have loved to wander thus. They have not restrained their feet. Therefore, he who is does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. So God says in response to a prayer, says, well, they've wandered all over the place spiritually. And so that's why they're in trouble. That's why they're about to get the penalties of the Deuteronomy covenant. Verse 11, he who has said to me, do not pray for the welfare of this people. Wow. Again, this is really frustrating that we see this here, that things are so bad that God tells Jeremiah, knock it off. Do not pray to me about these people anymore. Do not beg for mercy for them. Because they have been given patient mercy and time to repent. Lots longer than you've been alive, Jeremiah. So they are getting what's coming because of what's happened in the past. Though they fast, I will not hear their cry. Though they offer burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword by famine, and by pestilence. So that's the mechanisms of judgment. They will die at the hand of the sword. They will die because of the changes in the weather pattern and uh, the famine that comes from that. And they will die from diseases that run rampant during times of war and famine. Verse 13. Then I said, Ah, My master, he who is, behold, 
the prophets say to them, You shall not see the sword, nor shall you see famine, but I will give you assured peace in this place. So Jeremiah jumps in and says, But God, the false prophets are out there telling them everything's going to be fine that they're not going to have to see the sword, that they're not going to have to deal with famine, that they're not going to have anything but peace because of this place, this temple, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Remember that? And God says back to Jeremiah, verse 14, He who has said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, nor did I command them or speak to them. They are prophesying to you a lying vision, worthless divination, and the deceit of their own minds. So God leaves no doubt as to what's going on with these guys. They are faking it. They are just giving the people what the people want to hear. Makes me think about 2 Timothy chapter number 4, that uh, the reason why we need preachers of the inspired written word is because people are going to start looking for teachers that will give them what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. And that is definitely a problem in the church today. And we need as preachers and uh, persons within the church to quit listening to anyone that doesn't preach God's word as God intended. That's just an imperative. Uh, And when you follow a false preacher, when you follow a false teacher, you can expect to suffer under God's judgment. Because you got to listen to his word, not what you want to hear. Uh, Verse number um, 15. Therefore, thus says he who is concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, although I did not send them, and who say, sword and famine shall not come upon this land. By sword and famine, these prophets shall be consumed, and the people to whom they prophesy shall be cast in the streets of Jerusalem, victims of famine and sword, with none to bury them, their wives, their sons, their daughters, for I will pour out my evil upon them. So they will get the just desserts of listening to false teachers. Judgment. That's what he says. And so Jeremiah's responsibility, as is the responsibility of every Bible preacher, you just preach what God said. You stick with the word and you be true to it. Verse 17, you shall say to them this word, let my eyes run down with tears night and day. Let them not cease, for the virgin daughter of my people is shattered with a great wound, with a very grievous blow. So Jeremiah, you go out there and you just bawl your eyes out and preach. You just go out there and cry about the situation, but you tell them the truth of what's coming. Verse 18, if I go out into the field, behold those pierced by the sword. If I enter the city, behold the diseases of famine. For both prophet and priest ply their trade through the land and have no knowledge. I remind you again, poor Jeremiah. He spends 40 years from the beginning of his ministry until the fall of Jerusalem, telling them what's coming. But it's not just simply he's telling them what God told him. He's telling them what he's seen prophetically. God has showed him over and over and over again the coming judgment. So he has already seen Jerusalem destroyed. He's multiple times. He's already seen all the people die multiple times. He has seen people starve to death over and over again in his visions. Is there any reason why he wouldn't be known as the weeping prophet, bearing all of that 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 heavy load of seeing a people that refuse to listen to the message, but are barreling down the highway toward judgment. Verse number 19. Have you utterly rejected Judah? Does your soul loathe Zion? Why have you struck us down so that there's no healing in us? 
We looked for peace, but no good came. For a time of healing, but behold, terror. Now, this is one of those times that Jeremiah is allowed to be honest with his own feelings. And he wants to know, God, are you just going to write us off? Are, are you, are you going to strike us down and there won't be any hope? Verse 20, we acknowledge our wickedness, O he who is, and the iniquity of our fathers, for we have sinned against you. Now that's more him confessing the sins of others than himself. He is a righteous, godly man. That's why God is using him. But he, he has at least some people around him, it would seem, that are on the same page with him. And they are crying out, the sins of their, of their culture, of their people, and now begging God to please take in consideration the repentant ones. Do not spurn us for your name's sake. Do not dishonor your glorious throne. Remember and do not break your covenant with us. Are there any among the false gods in the nations that can bring rain? Or can the heavens sh give showers? Are you not he who is he who is our God? We set our hope on you, for you will do all these things. So he says, you are the only one that can save these people. And, and we are trying to get that message out. We're trying to acknowledge that message. Please, God, don't write us off. Now, how does God respond? Well, we've already seen him tell Jeremiah, a couple of times now, don't you dare pray to me about these people. Look at chapter 15. Then he who is said to me, Though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my heart would not turn toward this people. So even if the biggest named prophets of the past, Moses, the beginning of the covenant, Samuel, the beginning of the kingdom, even if those two big names were begging God to have mercy on this latter stage of Judah, God would not change his mind. Send them out of my sight and let them go. So get these people out of there. And when they ask you, where shall we go? You shall say to them, thus says he who is. Those who are for pestilence to pestilence, those who are for sword to sword, those who are to famine to famine, and those who are for captivity to captivity. Now, I, I, that section is going to be quoted in other prophetic books later. I think Ezekiel and Zechariah, if I'm not, I'm not mistaken. Uh, and I think there's an allusion to it in the New Testament as well. So God basically says, Everybody's going to have happened to them what will happen to them. Nobody is going to get a, a pass. Some of you are going to die of diseases. Some of you are going to die in the middle of battle. Some of you are going to die because you're starving. And some of you will survive all this just barely, and you'll end up going to another country. That's the way it's going to play out. Verse 3. I will appoint over them four kinds of destroyers, declares he who is, the sword to kill, the dogs to tear, and the birds of the air, and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. So we're talking about the fallout of war and famine and pestilence. The predatory animals and birds move in, and they are the ones that clean up the dead bodies because there's no one left to bury. Verse 4, And I will make them a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth because of what Manasseh the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, did in Jerusalem. Now this is so, so sad. Now we know, because we've seen the passages, that Manasseh did eventually repent toward the very end of his life, toward the very end of his reign. And so he is among the righteous dead when these words are penned. But it was under his sinful reign 
that Judah crossed the terminal point, entered into the point of no return when they would come under God's judgment. So his name comes up here as the one that tipped them over the edge. Verse 5, who will have pity on you, O Jerusalem? Who will grieve for you? Who will turn aside to ask about your welfare? You have rejected me, declares he who is. You kept going backward. So I've stretched out my hand against you and destroyed you. I am weary of relenting. So God says, I am tired of being patient over and over and over again. So judgment has to finally fall. I have winnowed them with a winnowing fork in the gates of the land. I have bereaved them. I've destroyed my people, for they did not turn from their ways. So this is God's response to Jeremiah praying again for these people. And God's response is, no, I'm done. This is the point of no return. I will have mercy in the future, but not this time around. Verse 8, I have made their widows more in number than the sand of the seas. I have brought against the mothers of young men a destroyer at noonday. I have made anguish and terror fall upon them suddenly. She who bore seven has grown feeble. She's fainted away. Her son went down while it was yet day. She has been shamed and disgraced. Now, what this means is a lady who was married had seven boys, she's lost them all. She's lost her husband, she's lost her sons, she's now going to lose herself. It's over with. And this is all part of the judgment that is coming upon Judah for not keeping the covenant. And the rest of them I will give to the sword before their enemies, declares he who is. We'll mark our place right here, and we will continue looking at God's warnings of the impending judgment through Jeremiah tomorrow, the next time we're able to get into God's word.